All the leaves out of the trees are different colors, and the different colors make them beautiful. Look around you and imagine everyone next to you as the greens and the oranges and the reds and the yellows. And together, yeah, I guess. We're a beautiful fall No, I'm black today.
But it doesn't change the, bat, the fact that we still fundamentally disagree with some other people. Christians of good conscience disagree with other Christians of good conscience. Just because someone else is of a different political persuasion that doesn't make them good or bad, just different. But emotions push our opinions, and that's what's been happening over these last few months. And we have that inner urge to always be right. I think we learned that from our teachers. Those who study brain matter say there's a possibility that the brains of liberals and the brains of conservatives are actually wired differently. Um, they're still doing experiments with that. Unfortunately, they haven't been able to find any on either side. <laughs> um, but one study suggests that human beings attempt to employ logic or reasons in matter of opinion and principle. When we try it, it doesn't work. We say, well, I need to think about that. Uh, the more our opinions are reinforced by like-minded persons, the people we hang out with and enjoy being with, we get wound tighter and tighter with our points of view to the point they are almost impregnable. The more we reinforce ourselves and listen to those around us in news that reinforce us, the less we're open to others. Now, we each something that is logical to us. That makes sense. We've all done it. Yep, that's where I start. Now, once we have built our argument on what seems logically consistent to us, we assume that any view that is inconsistent with ours had to have started in an illogical spot because obviously they weren't as intelligent as we were or as logical. And so their side becomes irrational, morally deficient, and just less informed. Where does this all lead us? The sentence in your bullet. Trusting humbly in the Holy Spirit can lead us to calmly invite others to explain their logic before we start to explain ours. That invitation is what makes us Christ like. Will the children come forward, please? Oh, that one was for me. Okay, I think he's on to something. That's 
sit with somebody else? Every, everybody take a piece? That's a good idea. Right. Pass it around. Oh, everybody, Eric, how big is your piece? Do you need to share it with somebody else? Share them with that piece. Thank you. Everybody got one? Isn't that wonderful when we say, give us this day our daily bread? Oh, oh, Courtney has a big, you got enough? Because Courtney is going to be very generous this morning. <laughs> now that your mouths are full. Oh, wait. Sylvia? Sylvia needs a piece. Oh, Ari needs another piece. She can have another piece because that's a big one. Uh, Courtney, mm -hmm. a little bigger, please, for sister. <laughs> Reminds me of a lady outside of St. Paul's feeding crumbs to the birds. <laughs> okay, let us pray. She got it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Thank you for sharing.
let us confess our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, saying with the angel, He will save his people from our sin. With John the Baptist, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. With Isaiah, He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. With Simon Peter, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. With God the Father Almighty. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Hear him. With Jesus himself. The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill be raised on the third day. With Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. With Jesus on trial. Hereafter you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. And with Jesus after he rose from the dead. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Amen. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For our introduction to the gospel, today we're going to be reading from the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is the oldest gospel and was written to encourage Roman Christians and to prove beyond a doubt that Jesus is the Messiah. Mark's style, often using the word immediately, is to present a rapid succession of vivid pictures of Jesus in action. His true identity is revealed by what Jesus does. It's not exactly by what he says, but what he does. Mark's gospel has 18 miracles and only four parables. Jesus is on the food. Our first gospel reading comes from Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 to 36. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather she grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, 
Do not fear, only believe. Mark continues in his gospel, the disciples are not doing too well with understanding what Jesus has to say. And so he begins to talk about his suffering. And so, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And then he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected. And the scribes, uh, by the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said all of this openly. But Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. God of all mercy and grace, have mercy on our ignorance, have grace on our understanding, and guide us to believe. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the cover of the Presbyterian Women's Bible Study this fall. You can't see it too well from where you are, but there's a poster down in the hallway by the other door. And for those of you who are a little closer, you can see that it's Jesus. Now what you can't see on this, unless you look really, really closely, is it's 544 photographs that make up that picture of Jesus. And that photo montage are of animals and of people and of plants. And so the person who put all of those photographs together calls it the living Jesus. Now, it took all of those pictures together to make that photo of Jesus become visible and understandable to each of us. So, I believe in the theory of relativity. Anybody want to explain that? No, Tom probably could. <laughs> okay, there's only a very few in here that could. But this is not the Einstein theory. This is the theory about all of us that we are all relatives. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ because God is our Father. And it also means that we only know the truth, relatively speaking. Not only is our idea of truth inadequate, it also comes through our brothers and our sisters. And once we accept this theory of relativity, then we can proclaim our faith in God, who is absolute. In other words, you and I don't know the whole truth about any situation. We don't even know the whole truth about ourselves. We're rather confused sometimes how we react to something and lash out at somebody else or what brings tears to our eyes sometimes in a moment that just gives us a recollection of some place in our past. But we can know and believe in Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Absolutely, not relatively speaking, absolutely. John Stuart Mill once wrote that people are generally right in what they affirm and usually wrong in what they deny. What we deny is generally outside of our own experience and about which we should usually remain silent. So think about the next time somebody asks you a question about do you understand and you say yes. That's probably something we do understand. But if you say, well, do you believe this? No, I don't. That's garbage. That's hogwash. That's Maybe we should be silent and say that's part of our ignorance. Or maybe that's just the way our brains are wired. Or put it this way. Imagine we had 544 people in here this morning, each one with a different picture of who Jesus is. And imagine if we just said, okay, Carol, tell me who, who Jesus is. Caroline, tell me who Jesus is. Maggie, tell me. No, no one would be wrong. No one would be right. 
But 544 together would give us a clearer picture of Jesus. So Jesus is on the move, talking to these different people and listening to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And he's getting all these different kinds of answers because people have different points of view. One photograph is never adequate. Now, Mark is a certain lens on the life of Jesus, as the Presbyterian Women's Study has said. Matthew and Luke, for instance, have our wonderful birth stories of Jesus that we read at Christmas time, that we sang about in our first Christmas carol that we heard about in the choir anthem. His disciples don't understand that it's about life and death and resurrection, and it all comes together. And so three times, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10 in Mark, Jesus tells about his suffering. Each time the disciples say, no way. We don't want somebody that we love and cherish to have to die and suffer. So the Women's Bible Study has nine chapters, the different lenses that we look at Jesus through. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the epistles, and it goes on through several others. Uh, some of you can remember the old camps, the new ones have these now, versus the new ones have these now too, where you have different lenses. And so you might start off with a basic lens that uh, is about that size there, and then you say, well, I want to take some different kinds of pictures. And you say, I want to I get a lot closer to others. So you get a telephoto lens and you can zoom in on kids up in the balcony and see if they have any bread between their teeth or what they eat for breakfast. Uh, and then sometimes we want to just see everything at once. We like the big picture, and that's called panorama on our cell phones now. But in the old days, uh, that was called wide angle, and you could take one picture up here and show the whole congregation. And then some of us like to see the little details. And so there's a macro lens that you can put on a camera, and you can look at a tiny flower or a little bug, if you're into bugs or flowers. And all those lenses give us a different point of view on what each person would call a different reality. Uh, by the way, this is an old film camera, and if anybody would like this, it's sitting on my closet floor, it's doing no good, you can't buy film anymore, but if anybody would like these antiques, uh, for five bucks I'll let you have them. <laughs> Maybe four. So again, Jesus said, who do people say that I am? So he's asking, what lens do you have on when you look at Jesus, and how do you answer that? What do you say? Peter tried and answered it. It was a good one. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are the one who is coming into the world. And Jesus says, yes, he's got it. And then a couple of verses later, he messes all up, just like we do. We see one picture of Jesus, and it's fairly clear. And then we just kind of put our own actions into it, like Peter did. He loved his Lord. And when Jesus said he had to die, he reacted to that from his gut, from his heart, saying, no, Lord, you, you can't die. We're just, we're just beginning to love you. And Jesus responds, no, each of you have to carry the cross. So what stories of Jesus, what photographs of Jesus are we passing on to our children? and our children's children, and how does that impact how they get through life? Birth, death, resurrection, our windows in the chapel tell part of the story of Jesus. The windows in here tell what each of us, but each of us add another dimension to Jesus. When he touches us, and he has us touch others. So the woman is sick, and this woman has heard about Jesus. The doctors have all failed. But she reaches out and just touches the hem of his garment. And she knows she is well. You have been around people who have loved you. And they have said things to you. And you just, wow, I feel, I feel better. I feel loved. I know I'm accepted. I, I know I am a real human being. I know who I am. And we have been touched by Jesus. Now, not everyone gets to feel touched by Jesus. We, we like distance from people. 
And the reason is it's safer because once we allow someone to love us, we also allow them to withdraw that love or to have that love be inadequate. So we need a fuller picture of Jesus. He did yell at Peter, but a few moments before he affirmed him. So how do we how would we get all of our different views of Jesus? I told a couple of you this story a little while ago. Uh, it was about a Sunday school class I had and I church. And I said, we're going to pretend that we're in the first century. And Christians were killed just for gathering and worship. And so we had to hide. And I had the whole class stand up, went down the hallway, down some steps. And we went into the boiler room of the church. There's dirt there and the pillars that hold up the church underneath. And the foundation were there. And it was cobwebs and everything else. And I had some chairs there. And we sat down in a circle. And I said, we are now deep underground in first century Rome. We don't have a choir, we don't have a choir director, we don't have an organist, no flutes, just ourselves. And as we sat in that circle, no hymnals, no Bibles, I said, what do you remember about Jesus? Oh, oh uh, Good Samaritan, I remember that. Uh, tell me the story. And we started telling the story and someone got the first person walking by and said, wait, who, who was the second one? There was a, there was a priest and... The, and another person finished the story. And then we came up with another story and someone had half of it. And then someone started to sing a hymn. Yeah, and they, yeah what's, the, what's the next line there? And someone else filled in for them. And so the scriptures and the early hymns came alive. Had a complete, none of us had a complete understanding or a complete memory of who Jesus was. We needed each other and our own experience because we relate to the part of Jesus in the Gospels that we most need or most need to share with others. Alan Payton in the novel has a character speaking of heaven who says, when I get up to heaven, which is my intention, the big judge will say to me, where are your wounds? And if I say I haven't any, he will say, was there nothing to fight for? We have these Bibles and we have these hymnals and we just kind of leave them aside rather than realizing it is the heart of the gospel that is worth fighting for in the best sense of the word in loving one another and especially loving the unloved. Claire of Assisi, who lived in the same place St. Francis did, was a nun who was a hermit. She did not speak. All she did was labor she prayed. And that group, that order of Claire, uh, had her also do some writings. And one of the things that she wrote about is she went around barefoot, sleeping on the ground, eating no meat, and observing almost complete silence, was something she called the mirror of the cross. In the midst of that hunger, in the midst of that loneliness, she would look at the cross and see the suffering of Jesus reflected back at her. So she knew her hunger was understood by the one who was on the cross who hungered. She knew her suffering that she had was reflected from the cross from the one who suffered. And she realized that if Jesus had that incredible capacity to love others, we could also. Even in the midst of suffering, knowing that he suffered, she could suffer also. Uh, Judy Syker, who writes this study that the Presbyterian women are studying, says that we each serve, that Jesus serves as both windows and mirrors. So as the Gospels are written and we read that, part of it is a window and we get a glimpse into the life of Jesus and how these Gospel writers wrote them. But it is also this mirror that Claire of Assisi was writing about. We get to see ourselves reflected in the life of our Lord. You see, Jesus knew his mission. His mission was to reach out to those that no one else would. People called him a Samaritan lover. And remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the Samaritan woman at the well, an outcast going to the well midday all alone. And Jesus went to her, even though the other Jews were not even able to speak to a woman and especially not a Samaritan woman. They found the Samaritans strange, standoffish, dangerous, lazy, and immoral. 
And we could put all those words to the people that we dislike. And then Jesus tells a story about a Samaritan man, about a Samaritan leper who gave thanks. And he broke down those barriers with others. And that's what Mark gets across in his gospel, the breaking down of barriers by being the one who suffers with people. About a third of Mark's gospel is the last week of Jesus' life. So not too many teachings, not too many parables, a lot of healings, a lot of actions, a lot of things immediately happening, pushing us to be more urgent about our discipleship. So how do we walk in his footsteps? Who would you like to get to know better in our community who is pushed off by some others? People must be held accountable. We must be held accountable to follow in Jesus' footsteps, to carry our wounds, to answer on Judgment Day for the ways in which we have carried that to others, to share ourselves with others, to teach others through the life of Jesus by leading a life seeking to follow in His footsteps. We're always on a mission trip. So remember what Dan Aykroyd said in the Blues Brothers. We're on a mission for God. Let us pray. Lord, we're traveling on that journey. And we are on a mission for you. Strengthen us each day as we see these different views of you to know how to follow you more clearly. In Jesus' name, amen.
Save us from regrets of the past. Grant us the certainty of your presence with us in the present. For all this we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today for the gift of our flowers for our morning worship service in memory of James King, Kenneth and Patricia Holder, James Walling, and Jerry Pullman by Randy and Cindy Walling. Rummage sale sorting continues this week. Uh, we need more volunteers to help in case. Stop by as long as you can. Uh, and uh, uh, we also have the Christmas child boxes out in the assembly room, and the instructions are right next to them, and you can fill those. Are there other announcements this morning? Yes, Jan. about her grandson Donald who uh, does maintenance and lots of other things at Ed Point Hills uh, and needing some help in clearing trees and he's done some Facebook and they're, and they're chopping them all up so if you know of anyone who might be able to help out in that project see Jan or get on Facebook okay
It gave part to a man on the street. On the street. The man on the street was grateful. For two days, he had nothing to eat. After he finished his dinner, he left for his small entry room. He didn't know at that moment that he might be facing his food. On the way, he picked up a sugar of a and took him home to get one. The puppy was very grateful to be out of the storm. That night, the house caught on fire. The puppy barked with no arm. He barked till he woke the whole household and saved everybody. One of the boys that he rescued grew up to be president, all this because of a simple smile that had not cost a second. <coughs> so how many people does it take to make a difference in someone's life? As I was sitting in the balcony last Sunday, I was looking at all the empty views and listening to the sermon, and I thought, well, what can I do? I was reminded of a time not long ago when I wasn't coming to church. It was a difficult season in our lives, and I wasn't making church a priority. And one fall evening, I was sitting at home, working on some work for school for the phone ride. And it was Barb Wheeler. And she said, I was just thinking of you, and I wanted you to know how much I miss seeing you at church. And we came back the next Sunday, and we've been back here ever since. So how many people does it take to make a difference? One. Be As the children showed in their skit, you can do something that starts a ripple effect that continues farther than you can imagine. In the assembly room and by the front door, there are tables that have names of members of our church who we haven't seen in a while. We miss them. Take a name or two and make contact. Pick someone you know and is seen here with us. Give them a call and share a memory you have with them at church and invite them to the fall outing at the Peak Friday Maze on the 30th. Let them know about our small groups. Since you know them well, ask them specifically how some activity is going in their life right now. You know they're busy doing good things with their family, or they'd be here too. Help them make a connection of how important worship has been to you, and how much fun the picnic and maze will be for all of us together. Tell them they can invite a friend to join us. Will our pews be full by next Sunday? Maybe not. But even if one person knows that we're thinking about them and missing them, it will be worth our time. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. For our call to stewardship, let us think about this. Where Christ walks, we will follow. Where Christ we will listen. Where Christ suffers, we will hurt. When Christ calls us to do for others, we will. And the ushers, please come forward.
This is prayer in the name of the Lord of the Child, Jesus. Amen. Amen.